France is pushing ahead with a big with a plan to levy big taxes on big tech. The program will take effect in January and it's expected to generate 500 million euros in 2019. Industry giants Google, Apple, Facebook and Amazon will all be hit by the tax, which aims to combat the corporate structuring those companies use to shelter profits in countries with low tax rates. Uh, well, let's get a bit more on this story with Alistair Sanford, who joins us in the studio. Good morning, Alistair. Good morning, Belle. Uh, now, France had, had originally tried to bring in an EU-wide version of this plan. It's now just deciding to go ahead on its own. Uh, why is it pushing this ahead so urgently? Well, uh, Bell, as we know, France needs to pay for the cost of the social measures announced last week by uh, Emmanuel Macron in the midst of the Yellow Vest protests. Um, they're put at some 10 billion euros. Uh, he announced that they're going to raise the minimum wage, make overtime exempt from tax uh, and cancel taxes on low income uh, pensions. Now, France and Germany had been pushing for this EU-wide GAFA tax, GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. Uh, there have been lots of frustration at the allegedly miserable contributions that some of these companies make to uh, national economies while at the same time making a packet. In fact, there had been some surprise that the Yellow Vest protesters hadn't actually targeted these companies a bit more, more specifically. Earlier this year, the European Commission proposed a 3% tax on revenues on large uh, internet uh, companies, but opposition from several nations effectively uh, killed it off. Uh, critics also said it would breach um, international rules on, on equal treatment. So now France is going, what the hell, we're going to go for it alone. Uh, the finance minister, Bruno Le Maire, and the prime minister say it could bring in 500 million euros next year. Uh, they want to get it through almost immediately. They're looking to attach it to a business law that's already before Parliament. And they say it'll be modelled on the proposal that was put by the European Commission uh, earlier this year. Facebook has given a fairly neutral response, saying we respect the law, um, but pointing out it's made voluntary measures uh, already. But the measure has been criticised by an association representing the tech giants in the States, who say they would prefer a multilateral approach. Of course, these companies are huge across, uh, across the EU. Uh, how have other EU countries responded to France's measures? Are they likely to implement the same sort of thing? Well, I hinted at the opposition from several countries. There are, many nations are attractive because they offer a low tax business environment. Uh, Ireland, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, the, the Czech Republic, to name five. Uh, in turn, Lots of, well, several other countries, uh, France and the UK among them, uh, accuse firms of channeling profits through uh, those low tax states. So the UK, for instance, announced in its budget in, in October that it's going to bring in a, a digital tax uh, in, from 2020. Uh, the Chancellor has said um, that progress at international level has been painfully slow. Uh, so the French are saying we're not going to wait for that. They're going to renew the push also at European level. France hoping to work with Germany to get the EU to bring in this EU wide tax and, and put it in, uh, uh, get it together for by March so that it can be implemented uh, a couple of years ahead. All right, well, thank you very much. The 500-kilometre border between the North and the South of the Republic of Ireland lies at the heart of the Brexit impasse. Uh, the greater Britain's independence from the EU, the greater the risk that border controls will be reintroduced in a region that's become used to freedom of movement. NBC's chief global correspondent Bill Neely has this special report now uh, from that border. The Irish border, more open than almost any in the world, with more roads crossing it than between the US and Canada, or Russia and Eastern Europe. The border runs right down the middle of this river, and here in the town, it's invisible. I'm crossing now from Ireland into the UK, easy. And that's the way people here want it to stay. Today already I was across the border maybe five times. You've been across five times today? Yeah. And that's perfectly normal? Perfectly normal for anybody here. So road closures? Be a disaster. After Brexit, this will be Britain's only land border with the European Union. There are real fears here that if Britain crashes out of the EU without a deal, a so-called hard border will be imposed. So the border goes through the lake. There, yes. are, there are British fish and Irish fish. Yes. <laughs> John <laughs> Sheridan dreads the return of border controls. Customs officials, police, soldiers, soldiers. of two countries. Yes. It was militarised yes. and it was a pain in the neck. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
and that's all gone. Reviving a guarded border wouldn't be easy. This church is in the UK, its graveyard is in Ireland. In Maoris, there's no border. We just go about our life as normal. And that's the way it should stay? Of course, it has to stay like that. The old border posts are abandoned, but hardline British Brexiteers would put them back so Britain could be free forever of EU ties. And that prospect stirs fears here of violence. You put up physical infrastructure that people can protest at, or God forbid somebody can attack, the genie gets out of the bottle very quick. The genie of violence. Yes, possibly, yes. It might never, it'll never be, we hope it never happen. It'll never be on the scale, but you would see sporadic attacks, absolutely. The border is the center of the Brexit battle, but for decades it was literally a battleground. Memorials to the dead litter the borderlands, the scene of some of the worst massacres of Northern Ireland's long conflict. The violence here claimed three and a half thousand lives. And there is a real fear that a chaotic British exit from the European Union could rekindle conflict. It could bring the troubles back. Bring the violence back. It could bring the violence back. We had 30 years of continuous war. It was horrific. It's nice, the life we have now with peace. Peace in Northern Ireland made the border open and free. In one border village where dead gunmen are celebrated, a threat if Britain forces a hard border. Do you really think that we're going to have them coming in to get us again? I would say, let's go back to war. War and economic collapse are the twin fears of the tight-knit communities that straddle the border. 55% of our lamb goes to the south for processing, 35% of our milk travels south for processing. That could be completely shattered, so our business could be ruined and the future of our family and our children uh, could also be ruined. It's that serious? It's that serious, absolutely. If we got a hard border in Northern Ireland, it would be desperate. It would really be the end of Northern Ireland. For now, Britain wants to avoid a hard border by tying the UK into the customs union, the controversial, unpopular backstop. Here, they're afraid that'll be ditched and their open border sacrificed with dangerous consequences. A minority here did vote for Brexit. If we're going to do Brexit, let's do it and be done with. The majority have just one word for it. It's a mess, like it is just total mess. A mess thousands in Northern Ireland want to escape by getting Irish passports to remain EU citizens. Six, seven, eight times the normal volume of passports since the Brexit vote came in about two years ago. People looking for Irish passports? Looking for Irish passports, yes. But there's neither a pot of gold nor reassurance at the end of the Irish border rainbow. Just risk of ruin and of a return to a dark past. In just over a hundred days, Britain will leave the European Union. The biggest change in its status in 50 years. But some things won't change. The country will remain bitterly divided. The ruling Conservative Party will still be at war over Europe. And peace and prosperity here in Northern Ireland will be threatened and fragile. It didn't want to leave the EU, it will be forced to. And so an old wound, a scar in Ireland's green will reopen and nobody knows what damage that might do. It could take another 200 years for women to reach economic parity with men. That's the startling picture of inequality that a new report released this morning has shown. The good news? Oh, well, the gap has narrowed, but only slightly. Uh, the report, which is by the World Economic Forum, shows that even though the global gender gap has narrowed, men still dominate both the labour force and politics, uh, though economically the gender gap narrowed this year. Access to health, education as well as political empowerment uh, actually went down from previous years. Iceland is still the world's most gender equal uh, country. Well, let's get some more on this uh, with Sylvain Koch Mehrin, who's the president and founder of Women Political Leaders, which is a global network uh, for female uh, politicians. Good morning to Ms. Koch Mehrin. Thank you very much uh, for being with us this morning on the programme. Uh, one of Good the morning. areas... 
One of the areas where uh, women have found the, the least uh, representation and where the advances have been uh, the least good over the last year is political representation. Why is this such a problem uh, for women? Indeed, it's highly frustrating, despite all the talks and realizing that there is the need for more women in leadership, progress is still extremely slow. And in politics, as you just said, it's going backwards. 93% of the world's head of state and government are men. So why is it? Well, the World Economic Forum's gender gap report is a very powerful tool to measure the data. And to complement that, uh, we, as women political leaders, we launched the Reykjavik Index for Leadership, which measures the attitudes, the stereotypes. So how do people feel about women and men in leadership? Because those stereotypes eventually determine the speed of progress that we can achieve. And there is, it's very obvious that there still exists a lot of sexism towards women, women and towards men in terms of what do societies, what do people think, uh, what are their abilities to be leaders in various sectors? Uh, among the world's uh, 20 leading countries, uh, France, Germany, Britain even did pretty well. The US did really badly. It slipped uh, past 51st uh, position. Uh, do you have any idea or do you have any thoughts on to, as to why that might be? Well, again, it really is a um, deep societal question. So what do people accept as the roles that women and men have in societies. And it has to do, of course, with leadership, but it also has to do with the perpetuation of traditions, of stereotypes in terms of what's the place of the woman, what's the place of the man. And in our Reykjavik Index for Leadership, we measured across 20 sectors the difference of attitudes of women and men in leadership. And it's quite striking that these old traditions still seem to be so much determining the uh, perceptions of what are women and men able to do. And that's really is something that needs to be addressed both in terms of political leadership, business leadership, but also way beyond that, make it a big societal movement in order to change that.